All right, this meeting is being live streamed. Got it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and admit all. All right, I think we got the waiting room joining one by one here. So now that we're a minute in, figured we'd get rolling. Uh, thanks everybody for joining another edition of the Clear Calx Learn Hour, Clear Calx Expert Hour, uh, this one will be called, because um, we've got uh, David Ortican helping us out here and talking about some great projects that he's done in the past. So we could bump over to that next slide. While we're going through these first slides, everybody, uh, feel free to click that chat box, um, include where you're joining us from. Um, feel free to throw your camera on if you want, um, maybe even your title. Sorry, I'm looking over at my other screen, admitting people in from the waiting room um, every so often here. Um, but a very quick about clearcalcs.com. Uh, so I think we have quite a few people on this call who are unfamiliar with ClearCalcs or maybe haven't trialed in the past. So ClearCalcs is a cloud-based structural calculations software. Um, we combine powerful FEA analysis with easy to use tools for wood, steel, cold form steel, concrete, and that's beams, columns, footings, shear walls, connections, uh, the whole gamut. And we're aiming to be more accurate we do that through full transparency. We do not want to be a black box software. Um, so including all the code and standards checks, including definitions, visuals, everything like that um, for every uh, cat just hopped up on my lap here. Um, sorry about that. Uh, for every one of our calculators, uh, we want to eliminate wasted time doing that using our load linking. So dynamic load path tracking feature, our quick member selector, quick change material. So you don't need to start from scratch. If you want to swap between wood and uh, steel. And then last here, it's available everywhere. Like I mentioned, it is a cloud-based platform. So whether you're at home, at the office, on site, um, I was using ClearCalcs once when I was on a plane. So that works as well. Anywhere you are, ClearCalcs can be as well. And then I really quick make, meet the hosts. So you've got me, I'm our director of customer success, um, training sessions before you sign up, training sessions after you sign up, making sure to send you the right help content, really just here to make sure you're successful in clear calcs as we wrote there. And then we've also got the, rate, the great Laurent, who's our North American engineering content lead. So all these new calculators that you guys have seen in our US offering, uh, Laurent has been leading that effort. Oh, then I'll pass start. it over to Laurent from here. All right. Hey, I get to be the, the lucky guy who introduces David today. David's the star of our webinar today, and we're quite lucky to, to have him join us. So a little bit about David. Um, he is semi-retired, I believe, um, but after a 60-year career touching basically every single aspect of the construction industry in some shape or form, um, in particular, structural engineering, construction management, and in the last 25 years have been really focused on uh, heavy timber engineering. I think uh, David might be able to say a bit more about that later on, but especially with the uh, Timber Framers Guild and the Engineering Council there as well. Um, David's got a wealth of experience and he's looking to share it with us today and, and in general. And in fact, he's so inspired to share his engineering experience that he's recently published a new book called Consulting Engineering Success. And you can find it on Amazon Kindle in recently um, coming out as paperback as well. And I just heard that there might be an audiobook coming soon as well, where you'll get to hear David um, recite his book himself. And so really excited for that. Um, what it's about, it's basically all the lessons that David learned along the way. I personally read it. It, it wasn't a very long read, so you can read it all easily in a day um, or even less. And it's a really fascinating read. Um, I don't think... Um, I don't think David holds back anything. He's very vulnerable, and it's it's been really interesting to read. Um, I think some of the things that I thought was the most interesting was um, how David found oysters are a great way to find new customers, and then the four way test, which uh, is a very simple ethical guide, but sometimes simple is good. And I think this is one of those cases. I thought it was a really nice one, and I know I'll be thinking about it in the future as well in my career. 
And then the famous scenario, overworked and underpaid. That's the name of a chapter. I think we've all been there. We've all felt this. So uh, David tackles it head on. So uh, really thankful for it. You know, I'm pretty early in my career myself. So I, I think uh, it's been nice to know that I'm not the only one. <laughs> So with that, I think I'll hand it over to David. And I believe, David, you've got some friends along. So I'll let you introduce them as you wish. Um, but I think I'll, sh I'll share my screen or I'll let you share your screen and um, I'll let you take it away. OK, well, can you hear me OK, Laurent? Yep, we got you good here. All right. So uh, it's just such a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. I've, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And uh, I'm, I'm just thrilled to have some uh, cohorts and partners in crime with me. Uh, ben Broomgraber is going to be joining me talking about the Harry Potter barn. Uh, uh, and uh, Chris Miller is here to join me to talk about the wooden barn which was a very interesting project that we did together. And uh, I think I may have uh, inadvertently deleted my photos, so we'll get back to them here. So anyway, I'm gonna start uh, with the wooden barn. And, and uh, if you guys wanna know more about me, it's in the book. I just, I don't like talking about myself too much. So yeah. anyway, uh, trying to make these picture icons disappear to the right. How do I do that, Laurent? Um, I think if you double click on this, they should open up. Double click on what? Uh, on any of the pictures here. Yeah. So if you go down just where you've got the, uh, the picture of the barn there and you double click on it. Okay. That should open. Is that what you were looking to do? Yeah, I've got I've got uh, pictures of everybody interfering with my view of the barn, though. The, oh. the, <laughs> just, David, just grab the top of it like you would a folder and move it. Huh. Well, see the black bar at the top. Yeah, it's not going away. Just slide it, Chris. Did you? Oh wait, yeah. wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait, wait. Here we go. Here we go. All right, Thanks, I got Chris. it. Okay, sorry about that, guys. So the first job I want to talk about is a wooden barn. It's down in Central Florida. And the reason I picked this is it's kind of representative of a lot of things in, in heavy timber engineering and commercial structures. The disappointing thing about it, uh, I know from Ben's point of view and some others, is that it's it's certainly not traditional timber framing, although there are mortise and tenon joints uh, somewhere in it, I, not too many. But uh, in traditional uh, uh, mortise and tenon joinery, everything is done with, with wood joints as much as possible. But this is a heavy timber commercial building, and it's very representative of a lot of the barns, uh, wedding barns that are, that are being built around the country. And, and I thought uh, it would be a good example to show. So uh, for I'll just highlight these and we'll... So this is an architect's rendering that, that uh, Chris Miller did. And Chris is on the call with us. Chris is uh, a wonderful designer I've, I've enjoyed working with for many, many years. And uh, he was my partner in crime on this one. And uh, we did this barn for Bill Wooden, as I said, down in Central Florida. And uh, here's the interior frame. Uh, right. There's the interior frame, scissor trusses here. Uh, and most of these are metal plate connected joints, uh, if you will. The interesting thing about this barn was that uh, the, at the upper level uh, up in here, there was so much wind shear. This is 140 or 150 mile an hour wind region. And so uh, believe it or not, the, the wind perpendicular to the end walls was quite large and then up in this area where you see my pointer, we had a lot of windows. If I go back to the, you can see this strip of windows in here. And so there was no way to get any shear walls that would chase down to the foundation and through the lower roof system. So the wind was all resisted by a, a K truss uh, along those lines. And here off on the right underneath the window frame, you can see the K trusses, uh, very uh, large uh, balcony up here for uh, wedding pre-assembly. You can see the scissor trusses there. 
uh, another shot of it. So let's take a look. Bear with me just a second, I'll get to it. So I, I wanna go through the drawings with you, if you'll just bear with me. I had them open and then I lost them. We'll be there in just a second. Got to open the job file. I hate doing this under the gun. I don't know how the rest of you are with all this, but. Nobody's good at doing it under the gun. Okay, okay David. So, so uh, here's, uh, Here's the drawings on it. And I, I thought I'd just kind of go through these and point out some details and we'll just start at the top. Typically on our drawings, we have a set of general notes on the cover sheet, uh, often along with a rendering or maybe a rendering on the first page and the general notes on the second. And, and I think it's worth saying that over the, it's taken years and years and years to develop the prototypical set of general notes that I've used on heavy timber framing and heavy timber engineering. And, and there is a set, it may not be completely current, but if you go to the TF Guild website, go to the library, there is a sample of these notes. And it's not a master spec in the sense that the true master spec trademark was written. What it is, is, is a set of trigger notes. And I've tried to cover everything I can think of. So if you're using these, you'll just want to go through it. And, and every time I read every line, every paragraph, and I take out everything that's that's not relevant, and I add anything that is. So these are just all reminders of me what to include, what not to include. And you can generate a set of notes like this in about 15 minutes, uh, literally, or 20 if you're familiar with the job. So here's a, here's a rendering of it that Chris did, a beautiful rendering. I'm going to have Chris come on after I'm finished and talk a little bit about the design challenges. Interestingly enough, we're finding more and more people, uh, you know, uh, call and they want a timber frame, but they can't find an engineer to do the foundation or the shear walls or all the rest of it. So we're finding that increasingly uh, we're having to do the entire foundation design. And, and in this particular one, it was a monolithic slab on grade. Uh, let me see if I can. There's a monolithic slab on grade. And you can see the interior drop footings for the post here. And then over here on the right, these are the interior wall footings. There's a perimeter edge footing on a not so heavily loaded wall. There's one of the major wall footings right there with the hold downs. And this thing had, in the gabled end walls, had HDU 11 hold downs. The, the uplift forces were substantial, as you can imagine. The shear walls were short, and so it was quite challenging. And this, this is a ledger right down here on this bottom detail. This is a, a ledger for a stone wall that goes on it. This is the interior floor plan. Uh, stairs going up to both loft levels, big fireplace down here at the right-hand end. And this is the main floor frame. And, and these are pretty substantial girders. They're 10 by 20 uh, Douglas fir girders that span across here with a center support. So it's pretty heavily loaded. Here's the upper roof framing plan. You can see the ridge purlin and the, and the wall plates. So exterior end wall elevations. Nothing, nothing particularly unusual there. Here's a section through the building, through the loft on the left, <clears throat> and you can see the sidewall framing here on the right, and you notice the K trusses going through it here. Similar detail there on the other wall, center bay. We'll get into some of these connections in just a second. I'm gonna go down here. This is where it really starts to get interesting in high wind regions because there's tall walls here, platform frame, uh, at the floor level, big, heavy connecting straps from one level to the next all across this region right here. HDU 11's in here to hold down the wall. Same thing on the opposite wall with the chimney shaft, although that made a pretty nice shear wall, but I just didn't want to count on it. It was, it was external to the building, so the wood walls framed up to it, but uh, we, just, we just called it the way we thought we ought to do it. And then here's the upper window wall elevation. Lots of framing in here to get the window sizes he wanted. Here's a section off on the left. Uh, and then with the, with the long side walls, uh, that wasn't much of a problem for wind, uh, but we always put extra uh, anchors here at all the door jams. And of course the door jams are reinforced to take the tributary wind load, which against this wall was probably 
ASD wind load against that lower wall is probably 25 or 30 pounds per square foot. So it's it's not insubstantial, unsubstantial. And uh, also uh, in a wind region like this, be sure and check your studs for lateral wind loading. Uh, typically uh, in a high wind region, wind will control the design of the studs and not the axial load. Here's a shot of the end wall right here. Chris did it. Chris, you, you just did a beautiful job on these drawings. There's the opposite end showing all the framing. This is where it gets interesting. These are the trusses right here. Here's a typical heel connection over here on the left. You can see the see the plate. This is a, uh, Ben calls these curve plates. I call them knife plates. They're actually embedded in slots in the timber. And then in this particular case, I use bolts to, to uh, connect these through the timber. Uh, you can use pins, but the problem is, is the pin only subtends about six inches typically, or a little bit better of the thickness where the bolt grabs the whole uh, side member thickness and you get a lot of, lot more increase in capacity with a lot fewer bolts. So here's what it looked like at the heel. Uh, here it is up at the ridge. And then at the center connection with the, uh, with the scissor, uh, you have this with the two tension loads here. This is just a nominal compression going up in these two diagonals. These are these are actually braces to the to the uh, top cord and of course the king post in here in the middle. Uh, floor frame and showing the joist hangers for all the joists. And then these are just some typical details. One of the things that that uh, uh, we've often used is uh, a connecting splines here. Uh, this turned out to be uh, a drag strut uh, for the wind loading. So uh, uh, we kind of doubly reinforced it. And let's see what else we got here. That's about it. So, uh, Chris, why don't, uh, if you can click yourself on the audio and, and Laurent, make sure he can, we can hear him. Uh, would you care to share a little bit about your perspective uh, on the job? That was a really great project to work on. It took us a pretty good while. Um, I don't know if you remember, but the original design we started with was pretty much completely different than this. <laughs> Um, and we just had to keep modifying and modifying the original drawings that we started with weren't even scissor trusses. I don't know if, uh, David remembers that, but we had to, uh, had to design this thing where, you know, the usual typical design issues is you want to make it big enough timbers and, uh, but at the same time, not too big, not too bulky, um, keep it. Yeah. Or, or, you know, just aesthetically sound. Uh, the owner had a lot of input, which was uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but uh, we all know how that goes. But he was actually a pretty neat guy to work with. Very excited. Um, the spans and just the meticulous drawings was basically the biggest challenge of um, the changes as we got started and having to do and redo until we finally got it right, especially on the sheer wall stuff. But, uh, you know, David's always very meticulous. So it's, uh, you know, it, it made it a lot easier for me. And a lot of this, I did, he just told me what to do when I did it. So I was probably more of a drafts person than a designer on this one for the, after we, once, once we, after we got started. So that's really all I have to say about it. Um, well, Chris, don't sell yourself short. I mean, this, this guy has rescued me from complicated geometry situations uh, more time than I can remember, as as has Dan Kaiser, who will be on later talking with Ben about the Harry Potter barn. So, Chris, thank you so much for being on with us. And no problem. I, I know you've got a got a lot of pressure coming, but uh, uh, with with work there. But uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll look for you again soon. All right, see you guys. Okay, see you, Chris. Hey, David, can I chip in two things I see when I look at that? Why, sure. Yeah. Just, can you go back to that? Yeah. Two things, one. When you put that ridge beam between the trusses in an intermediate condom and rafter, what that does effectively is reduce some of the load on the scissors truss by taking it down the intervening rafter. So if you find yourself having trouble, you could have just spanned sideways. The panels could have actually probably gone from truss to truss and skipped that. But it is a way to ease up the connection forces in your trusses. And the other thing I would like to point out is that plate you detail for the bottom cord to the top cord of the scissors truss is beautifully done. Can you show that the, the three pins, the way they align? And I see this all the time. People slap a plate on the side of a the heel truss or where the top cord and the bottom cord meet. 
and they don't have the lines of actions of the connectors passing through the centroids of each other. And that means that what you're doing is you're twisting the plate out of one out of one quarter or the other. See that one? See how the line of action of the three the three bolts passes right through the centroid of the other one. So the, you know, the, and it's, what's critical here is that the top cord is supported. So it, those bolts in that member feel a different angle to the load to the grain than the ones, the ones in the bottom cord because the bottom cord is not supported on the plate or the post. It is pure tension pretty much. And, and those, so the line of action of those three bolts in the bottom cord now passes through the centroid and there's no net tendency to twist that plate out of, out of either, out of either uh, timber. And I see that violated a lot of times. People miss that and, and you end up trying to split the ends of uh, heavy timber cords. Thank you, Ben. Uh, another thing to kind of help resist rotation I like to do is put a stub tenon right here. I failed to mention that. Uh, that tenon is, is two inches wide and three quarters of an inch or an inch high. It just locks the joint, keeps it from rotating. We also try to put a little landing here on the top cord, inch or inch and a half, maybe two inches at the most, just to kind of hold this top cord in place as you're making this all up. And you'll notice that the vertical forces in here are all taken by a bird's mouth on this outside plate right here. So this, this rafter cord or upper uh, top cord is actually bearing on this plate. So all we've got to do is take care of the tension. So you resolve this into a vertical component and a horizontal component, and then resolve the horizontal component into an angle component going up the scissor cord, and then you can develop the design. Ben, thanks so much for pointing that out. And 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 why don't we just mention the same thing here at the uh, at the juncture of the bottom cord and the king post? You'll notice how the lines of action all pass through this point right here in the center. That you just you you want to completely avoid offsetting things because the next thing you know you're going to be involved in the design of a moment connection and that's not a place you typically want to go in heavy timber framing. It can be done, but it is a pain in the wazoo. And it's just not a great idea. It caused potential splitting and all kinds of problems. So anyway, all right, that's enough of that. Uh, ben, anything Thank else? No, I, Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I, I think I've been a bad host and I should have mentioned earlier. Um, I think David is going to be talking about this. If you have questions for David, um, feel free to post them in the chat at the bottom uh, and, and we'll be happy to go through them as well. Or you can unmute yourself and, and ask them directly as well. I'm, I'm sure David is fine with that. Um, Apologies, I should have mentioned that earlier. And I think someone was about to say something, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking now. I was only gonna say, don't get me started, David. I could speak on scissor stresses for an hour. <laughs> I know you can. So, <laughs> thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. you. You were very concise and succinct. I, that was good. Was it more questions on a, on the wooden barn? If not, we'll move on to Harry Potter. Okay, so. I've got a lot of photographs of this, but I thought I'd start with the drawings first. This is this is probably one of the most intriguing projects I've ever done. And, and because the professional liability insurance requirements were such that there was no way I could cover it, I asked Ben if he would be willing to be the structural engineer of record. And he said, well, I'll trust you once. <laughs> so, uh, it was more than that. We had to uh, we went through various cycles on the drawings back and forth. Uh, uh, I generated the couch, Ben checked them. Uh, they went back and forth and, and they were all finally sent off. But it was a very tedious, time consuming process. I'm embarrassed to tell you what the engineering cost on this was. In fact, I don't even know. I, you know, it's just like I kept it's sending not. bills into Harmony and they kept paying them. And so did Ben. So <laughs> I don't know what happened. But to take a look at, at this roof, isometric of the roof, and you'll the first thing that'll jump out at you is these trusses are 70 feet across on this 12-sided structure. They're in opposition. There are 12 of them. They're 70 feet long. And interestingly enough, the first challenge was this one is cantilevered. This end of this truss is cantilevered. And this end of this truss over here on the left is cantilevered. And here you see a better picture of it right here. So the, the orange trusses, had to be anchored on the opposite end to, to be counterbalanced. And then you're putting this one in 140 mile an hour wind load. So if you want to try to have some fun with the structure, this is a great place to start. And 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 I I am not up for ever doing another one. This is, you know, I've I'm doing little jobs right now. This was uh, but I loved it at the time and Ben and I had great fun doing it. And he'll come on here in a minute and talk about his side of it. So uh to erect it. Uh, it was necessary to design 
an, an erection platform because there was a hole in the floor. There was no way we could stand a post up in here to set this thing. And so this erection platform had all kinds of bevel cuts in it to meet the bottoms of those, of those rafter cords. Here's a nice color rendering. You can see the single shear wall on this side and then two open walls here, shear walls. I think there's another open one over here, three shear walls there, two open bays and so forth. So this was a tricky structure at best. Uh, hey, this David, post, go ahead. This is Dan. Uh, hey, Dan. Hey, can I give just a little background on this real quick? Oh yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah. so. Great. So I don't know if you mentioned, this is actually a, a ride at Disney. So it's the Harry Potter. It's one of the, you've got to know the story to understand, but it, it's a Harry Potter ride. So go back. Yeah, right there. So um, it the ride comes in the right opening. If you look at the left, top left image, the ride comes in there and circles around slowly to kind of show some animatronic ac action that happens. That's why there was no floor, because there's a lot of mechanical things. And then it comes out the left opening. Uh, and one of the real cool things on the left opening, you see some missing timbers. We actually had to uh, break the timbers and then we, we bought a blowtorch and scorched them. So it looks like this side of the structure was, was exploded out. So that truss wasn't even really a truss. It was just parts of a truss hanging there. Somehow David and Ben, they made that happen. But just the background is this is actually a, a ride at Disney for this uh, structure. So that's all I got. Uh, Universal Studios. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Universal yeah. Studios. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dan. That, that was very helpful. I, I should have covered that. Okay, so uh, continuing on, here's a typical cross-section of it. This this king king pin, if you will, and we'll see some details of it further in the drawing, is 26 feet high and three feet in diameter. This is a piece of work. And and uh, Ben and I talked quite a bit about this. And uh, at Ben's suggestion, uh, we, uh, we, we, we put this together in segments like a mast. And, and, and then it has diaphragm pieces in it out of double laminated uh, Advantech, an inch and a half thick, that stiffen it up and keep it together. And I, I worked on the assembly of this with uh, West Systems Epoxy, and uh, their technical, their chief engineer was very helpful with us. We wound up using G Flex Epoxy to put this together, and I'll show you a detail of that in a minute. Uh, down at the bottom with the tension connections in here for, for the ones that were working normally, there's a tie rod going across here. And uh, tie rod across the top. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see more of these details in a minute. Here are the shear walls. They had steel post, but wood frame shear walls. These are two by eight walls here uh, that were sheathed to take care of the shear uh, from the 140 mile an hour wind region. A little bit more shear wall detail there. Here we're starting to get into the kingpin detail. You can see how beautiful this is architecturally. If you look up in the right, up in the top right, you'll see there's a hole right here. That continues down through the entire uh, kingpin. And here, here it is, the 12 segments of the kingpin. This inner shell is continuous from top to bottom. The outer shell are the decorative ends uh, at the top and the bottom. So it's this inner shell that's about, I don't know, two, a little over two feet in diameter that's doing all the work. And over in this picture right here, you can see, if I could zoom in here, I can't get to my zoom tool. Let me see if I can drag this out of the way. Yeah, here we go. Let me put this at the bottom. So, so you'll see in here the the uh, the diaphragm pieces that help it not only hold its shape but keep it together from compression loading. And there's what well, there's two at the bottom, one in the middle, two in the middle, I guess, and three at the top where all the axial loads were coming together, or two. Anyway. Been a few years since I've looked at this. So, uh, and then on the uh, on the cantilevered trusses, this is a tension rod at the top that takes the, the tension in the top cord from uh, from one side to the other. Uh, and, and it's embedded, got washers right here that, that take that load. This is the bottom. You can see all the cross ties in here. I'll zoom in on that a little bit. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it, it wouldn't be helpful, but 
these are, let me just, one and three eighths inch through bolts with three quarter inch thick by six inch square washers. And these timbers are 12 by what, 20, 12 by 16 uh, timbers. It's just absolutely incredibly massive uh, uh, when you when you see it. It's, you know, one of the things that it's I've always struggled with when I'm doing a design is when I'm looking at a set of drawings like this on a computer, I have no real feeling for the size of the structure. And, and I'll, I have to go out in the yard and pace distances off and look up in the air and say, wow, that thing is really big. Just to give you an idea of the axial compression in a typical top cord, we needed a five inch, let me zoom in on that, a five inch bird's mouth right down here. And, and, and this bird's mouth can, can fail uh, with horizontal shear in this plane parallel to grain. So you have to check this and make sure it's okay. And then this is reinforced with screws. And I think the axial load in this particular top cord was something like 45 kips. And of course the bottom cord is sitting down here and uh, the, the vertical reaction is taken through this up through here and into the into the rafter cord. Let's get out of this. Uh, this is a very interesting detail right here where, where the top cords, where the trusses were cantilevered the top cord, of course, is in tension. And, and, and this is what we call a barrel nut right here. This one particular one is three inches in diameter and nine and a half inches long. And it's threaded for the one and three quarter inch diameter rod that's going from the barrel nut back up here far enough so that shear is not a problem. And then this is a five eighths inch thick, five inch square plate washer. <clears throat> and interestingly, I'll just throw this out. You can check it out if you want. But I've noticed for, for every inch of size on a plate washer requires an eighth of an inch thickness in steel to prevent compression deformation. So if it's a five inch square washer, it's five inch thick. It's a half inch washer. It's a half inch, four by four washer is a half inch thick. So the size, uh, the washer in inches is the thickness of the washer in eighths. And uh, that may be something worth checking out if you're into this sort of thing some other connections here. And so with that, uh, let me, let me, Dan, why don't you, why don't you add some comments? Well, let me do this. Let me show you guys some pictures uh, next. Uh, hang on, where'd it go? Here we go. Okay. While you're pulling that up uh, and Ron, feel free to unmute yourself if you want. Um, but Ron had a question on how the staves of the section king post in the barn were connected to one another. Yeah, well, the staves were connected with glue. There were is a G flex epoxy is how they were put together. And no biscuits. And and no biscuits under very highly controlled conditions, uh, and uh, yeah, it worked really well. Yeah. So David, just, just the adhesive, because you assumed that it was only going to be in compression, is that correct? Yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and I asked the question because I, I did a project that same kind of thing. And, and so we use staves much like you would make a, a mast or a very large flagpole. But mm -hmm. ours was a little different in that it was double tapered. So it had a, um, it was largest about a third of the way up. It was uh, a different diameter at the base and a different diameter at the top. So yeah. all the staves had to be run through a CNC machine. And the only way we could keep them together, because the glue would not hold, the only way we could keep them together was to mechanically lock them. So the CNC machine basically made uh, like a dovetail between each one of the staves that they interlocked. Uh, in wow. order to hold it together. Wow. That was a great question, Ron. I had to sit there and think about it. Well, it, because normally that would all actually be, and I would wonder what we meant. Do we meant uh, uh, hoop compression or hoop tension? Are we talking about axial tension and axial compression? Normally that thing would actually be in some tension because the bottom cords are not level. They are raised up. That's a bunch of scissors trusses that intersect each other, which means that, that they would normally induce tension in that in that king post because basically the king post is sucking up the uh, bottom cords so they don't do what they want to do just go flat in this instance because two of the trusses actually act in reverse order um in reverse there's a little confusion in what's that thing feel at the end of the day um and and uh 
interestingly enough, at the top, it does feel compression from the raptures that do squish in, but but uh, the tension doesn't get to the so the compression bears on the on the staves, but the tension right. doesn't because the tension both at the top and the tension at the bottom for the normal ones and the tension at the top for the cantilevered ones goes from rafter to rafter, cord to cord through the king post. So the king that's why Di David added all those diaphragms because there is this tendency to take this somewhat circular object and make it oblong because the compressions are the compressions are not balanced in there and uh, they're right. not. Yeah, I suspect those diaphragms were critically important. When when we did ours, we had diaphragms that we we um, had made up just as form work, but we found that it gave um, considerable increase in stiffness yep. to the column. And so it was pertinent to keep those diaphragms in there uh, for stability of the column. Yep. By the way, those diaphragms were led into the inside face of the staves too. So it once that once that assembly was put together, man, it was locked. It couldn't twist, rotate, I mean, or deform uh, at all. I mean, it was really rigid. But I'll have to tell you, I, you know, between me and Ben, you know, my first shot at the diaphragms was just gut feel. I, you know, I mean, we didn't analyze those mathematically. David, David this is this is being taped, David. You want to. <laughs> You really want to be a little thoughtful about how we how we go on record here. <laughs> I, I heard him say he thought it through thoroughly. Yeah, I think he said that too. Yeah, you're right. Okay, forget that. All right, so uh, Dan's just, hey, Dan, do you want to jump in here or you want me to go with the pictures and then come in? Well, I can tell stories about this shot for an hour, but one of the ones, that, a major disappointment to me was what once we, you know, we, the Imagineers down there at Disney or Universal came up with this big queen, king post, bullpen, whatever you want to call it. And the best that David could find was, I don't know, 16 by 16. It was going to be box tart and it was going to check. It was just not anywhere nearly as big as they wanted. So that's when we switched to the Cooper because we really needed an engineered piece of wood. We wanted a reliable component here in the middle. But the biggest disappointment to me was I said, okay, you chopped out, you knocked out two corner posts and the roof is not going to sag across those new openings in here. I said 20, nearly 20,000 people a day ride through this thing on, on sidecars, motorcycles. And they're all going to think that it's okay to knock out two big cornered posts out of a 70 foot diameter octagon. I think that's just, that's looking for trouble. Somebody, at least two people a day go through there and say, I don't need those stinking posts. And they go home there at whatever facility and they knock their posts out because it worked here. Anyway, they wouldn't let us say, I wanted to build it deliberately sagged at the corners and they, they wouldn't even talk about it. And I said, and I'm still, I'm still bitterly disappointed. Um, but the deflections, Ben, remember the deflections were not, it, it did no, settle for a few months, but the deflections no, were pretty minor. I've been down there, I've been down there twice so far on a maintenance program, and you can only get in after three o'clock in the morning. You get from three o'clock till six o'clock in the morning, because they just run this thing making money all day long, and then they test run it from, from 10 when the last client leaves until one, and then we can get in and look at it. And their idea of a good way to drill, deal with this thing at first was to have part of the experience have it as you came in, you would go through a burst of mist. So they had misters that were misting every one of these cars. And that's, that's like that's like 1,100 cars a day or something, misting the timbers and the clients. I said, so I sat there at this meeting with 30 people in suits at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I then they were talking about maintaining the thing. I said, "Well, how long do you think this Harry Potter fad is going to last anyway?" And I've never had more people just stare at me with evil. They said, "We didn't want to hear that." You know, this is. So I said, "Okay, well, if you want it to last that long, however long that is, then you stop the misting. Just stop it." You know. Yeah. Anyway, that's just a tip. Thank you, thank you Ben. So uh, just kind of you've seen a few of these photographs as I've gone through them. You can see the. Uh, the erection structure here in the middle to hold the king kingpin up and everything. And I will say, you know, to, to Ben's credit, I Ben's nickname in, in our industry is Dr. Joint. And and so this was the key joint in the structure. And and uh and while I did a lot of math on it, and by the way, I did check those diaphragms for buckling just to make sure you, you all understood that. So <laughs> anyway, uh, this this kingpin was just the key to making this all work and doing it in state construction. But this is a good shot. And and uh, as Dan mentioned, they they simulated a burned out structure here. Every timber in here was scorched to look like it was a gazillion years old. And it certainly did. And here's a close up. Another one there.
Well, come on, Mark, slide. Get over here. Could you give more credit where credit is due? <clears throat> Harmony Woodworks out of Boone, North Carolina, fabricated and erected this thing. And Dan Kaiser, I think you were working with them at that time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They did a they did an awesome job. Yeah, um, the, the, the really the, the fun part was the uh, the imagination guy, and it was the the guy came up to Boone. You know, it, all the work that David and and Ben put into this, you wouldn't believe how how. One of the most finicky and panic, uh, particular things was the guy who came. Apparently, he was uh, secondhand to uh, uh, J.K. Rollins, who wrote who wrote the stories, and he helped with all the movie developments and stuff like that. And it was very important to him the final texture of the wood. So we would uh, rough it up and and uh, uh, truly try to make that wood look as rough as possible. And he'd come visit and say, "That's not bad enough." you know, hit it with an ax and rip it out, put nails right. in it, pull it back out. And he just really wanted this thing to look as rustic as possible. Right. Well, it, uh, you've probably seen enough of the photos here. We'll get some questions in a minute. Thank you, Dan. That was helpful. I, yeah. And one funny thing is that uh, Wayne over there at Harmony, uh, the guy who was really kind of heading up building this thing, he really wanted to build this thing on the ground and fly it into place. And uh, the weight of it would require a, they got a cost from a uh, company that had a decommissioned Chinook helicopter and it was just, it, they couldn't afford it. So they, so that's why we had to build that tower to, to build it in place. But it, we did explore that possibility, but it was a heavy system. Yeah. And, and again, that tower needed to be constructed because the center of the floor was a hole. So you, yeah. you know, you had to put, had to put some kind of support in there. And it turned out, the, the tower turned out to be great because it was, it was self-stabilizing. One of the things I wanted to talk about just briefly was when I first started, started on this with Dan, I thought, you know, I'm going to build a model of this thing and see what, see how it feels. And so uh, I went over to my friend, John Pratt, the woodworker, and, and we, uh, we cobbled together this model and, uh, uh, just to see uh, how it would feel, put the walls in, put the openings in, and it, and it was amazing how, how what a great feel that I was able to get for just the inherent stiffness of the structure. And, and uh, when it came time to model the shear walls, uh, it, it was fairly easy uh, to do by taking, just taking the wind direction uh, <laughs> parallel to the walls uh, on all the sides to get the critical loading conditions. There it is. There you can see the, that's, this is a perfect illustration of the two cantilever bays. So Ben, anything else you'd like to add, Dan? Well, D David, I don't know if it's possible, but uh, I've got a video on my other screen. If Laurent can let me share a screen, I can do a quick uh, video through the ride if, if people are interested. Oh, that'd be great. What do you think, Laurent? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that, that'd be awesome. Um, <laughs> This will save you thousands of dollars of actually going down there and doing this yourself, by the way. That's right. That's right. I was just thinking I, I used to uh, to live in Florida myself, and I, uh, I, I'm i pretty sure I went through that ride at least once, and I was, you, I was quite the experience. You see my screen there, fine? Yeah, we got you. Okay. So, yeah, this is coming into it. This is part of the, uh, I guess, Hagrid's Magical Creatures ride on the motorcycle. So I'll go through it. It'll go through it, then I'll go slowly. But uh yeah, it comes in, and then this is the system. You see the uh, the hub there. And then it comes out this exploded face here is what I was talking about. Um, and you see the motorcycle to the left. So yeah, as you come in, uh, this is this is that whole spoked system. And over here on that top left, that's the part that was scorched. Everything else is just kind of antique. But over on the left, where the ride's about to go through, that's the part we actually took a blowtorch to. Oh wow. Uh, right there and you see every, all the the deckings busted up and and looks like it's kind of a cool system there but that's kind of a good view of what's going on that thing's massive you see the motorcycles over to the left uh so yeah how to design an exploded building yeah <laughs> yeah oh, this is great dan i hadn't seen this awesome video yeah it's it's just not, it's not mine that's not mine. i haven't been down there yet but um uh and, and one of the things that they did is that this was kind of a test for Universal Studios. Normally, they would build all this stuff in, in wood and steel and then just uh, do plaster to look like antique timbers. And so this was something they were exploring. Can we build authentic timber frames to, to, stim to simulate timber frames? And, and uh, 
I don't know at the end if the cost was worth it to them, but um, yeah, we, we got a beautiful product out of it. And uh, yeah, we'll see if the next time comes around, whether they go with the plaster or whether they do something like this. At one point, you know, on one of my trips, I was crawling around underneath and uh, I stumbled on some of the supports for that track that these motorcycles and sidecars, and they had been treated like that. And they were steel frames that had been treated and they were so good. I looked at this, I don't know why they didn't mess around with timber. But I kept yeah. my mouth shut. <laughs> yep. Well, Dan, thank you so much for that. And Ben touched on this a minute ago, but I think, you know, one of the most disconcerting aspects of this design was the fact that we were using Douglas fir, which is not the most decay resistant material in the world, in, in the world to weather, uh, protective coatings notwithstanding. And, and, and the fact that the timbers are exposed, normally you've got a roof over a timber structure like this, but this stuff being constantly wet and dry and wet and dry. And, and you know, we, we went to great lengths to stipulate coatings and how often and whatnot. Ben, do you have any idea? Have they been doing the maintenance on this like they should, do you know? Or maybe we shouldn't even say. Not as well as I would have them do it. It's a tough one. Um, you know, we, they are adding access so you can at least get up into the timbers now. I mean, not only do you get two and a half hours in the middle of the night, but uh, those open tracks and the open pits make it very difficult to move in there. There's no good way to even get up on the roof, but that we've insisted that they add that. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they're doing um, they're doing better, but, um, but you know, they really don't know what timbers are. I mean, at one point they were worried about the checking, of course, and uh, they wrapped airline cable that I would use as a clutch cable in a, motorcycle they wrapped it around lit loosely and put a cable clamp on it and called that a, a restraint on a checking timber that was like 14 by 16 or something whoa <laughs> i couldn't believe it. i said what do you think that's doing again it, it was time, a, time it, for it, some fully threaded screws this may be the biggest heaviest timber structure in florida yeah probably I mean, they just really it's it, i don't think they'll do it again but i'm glad they did this one yeah me too well, uh, thank you all for listening to this part of the presentation. Laurent, any questions from the group on this? Yeah, hey, thanks a lot for sharing this. This is, like I said, I, I got the chance to write through this and knowing that that you, uh, David, and everybody here had the, their hands on it is super special. Um, feel free to post your questions in the chat for David or for anyone else here um, about this. I had one for you, David. Um, obviously, there's a lot of mechanical stuff going on in there and you've got some exposed timbers. I'm curious, did you have to look at anything special in terms of fire? Uh, I, I, ben, do you wanna, you wanna address that? I, I, I mean, this, this material, the, the timber is the best thing, heavy timber I think is the best thing you can build a structure out of for fire resistance, personally, mm -hmm. and, and because you know, the outer surface of it will char an inch or two deep, and then you still got enough structure left for people to get out. So, you know, when we talk about a fire resistant structure, we're, you know, we're not talking about a structure that's going to be there, I think, after the fire, except in some rare cases where it's not so destructive, but it's certainly uh, ample for getting out. So, I mean, it, it just kind of comes with the territory if you're doing heavy timber. Now, given that some of the bolts heads might be exposed or something like that, in fact, I don't see, I think they were all, everything was buried in this. So mm. all of the connections here that held this thing together are buried well within the timber. In a 12 inch wide timber, they're six inches down inside the wood. Well, you're gonna get a inch and a half or two inches of char, that connection's still good. So uh, I, I think it, it, it just comes with the territory. Ben, you wanna add to that anything? I agree, uh, there's not a, the uh, of course it's only the firefighters who might be crawling on the roof that whose life would be in risk if this were to catch fire you wouldn't you wouldn't that would be scary if i were in a motorcycle and they were running me into the same flames they didn't do that but i think the building is also sprinkled yeah so, yeah because it's it's universal and they don't want to mess around this is a very risk averse group well you yeah you wouldn't want a fire to begin with so that makes good sense what what's next all right um just another question. I think um, you alluded to it earlier. Um, I think it sounds like most of these uh, theme park attractions, they're usually steel structures and then they'll have some plaster cover over them or something. Do you know what was the motivation with going to a, a mass timber 
structure in this case? Dan, why don't you address that? Because back in the early, they came to you, I think, and said, we did the one before in steel. Let's see what timber looks like. you want to comment any more on that? Yeah, I think they were just trying to see, uh, they were, it was kind of a cost comparison, but they were trying to make it as authentic as possible. And and as good as they are at replicating wood, it's still not wood. But from, from what Ben just said and what I've heard, they're, they're very good at it. Uh, so I think it was kind of a... Uh, a study for them to find out whether this is a feasible way to go and then in the future with projects like this and and i'm not sure what the conclusion was but it was kind of a can we make it more authentic and and how will it look and how will it perform questions yeah. like that yeah and and what the square foot cost on this finally was is anybody's guess because there was so much else involved and 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 so but but not inexpensive all right any other questions on this one laura i think okay. if you Oh, we've I'm got one there's more, there's more money in the basement than there's more money in the concrete and down all the machinery down in there than there is concrete and up. Yeah. And watch. And we've got a question from Ron here. Um, Ron, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, David, I, I may have missed it, but uh, were those barn timbers, were they treated, pressure treated? And if, if so, with what, or why weren't they spec um, that was, way? What was the thing? Uh, no, they were not pressure treated. This is all Douglas fir. Oh, 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 oh. Yep. Yeah, but yeah. you could pressure treat that. Say what, Ron? You could pressure treat the Doug fir. Yeah, yeah, we did not, though. It was yeah. not pressure treated. Yeah. That's was a there good. a reason? Was there a reason why not? I mean, if it were me and I was building something in Central Florida, uh, you know, with the humidity and the precipitation we've got down there and their exposed timbers, I would certainly suggested uh, using pressure treated timber. Was there a reason that wasn't the case here? Uh, you know, I can't really address that. You know, maybe maybe Mark Howell with Harmony could. It may have been a cost factor. It may have been a material availability factor. I just don't know, Ron. I mean, I, I think it's a great idea, you know, but uh, it was not. Okay. That's a great point, Ron, because I have friends in the Pacific Northwest and, and they have a regular, I mean, one or two frames a year where an exterior exposed truss like you're looking at, what happens is the water runs down the center cord and hits a bucket of mortise in the bottom cord and that's, that rots right out. And that's because of the rainy Northwest, let alone the rainy warm Florida thing. So those, some of the, some of the things as ever are, some of the rules are uh, detailed for success and let everything drain out as opposed to leaving an exposed bucket. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first line of defense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you know, Ron, these here you are. Thanks I, for being out there and I've got them putting flashing on some of the places where Dan's film showed you the, you know, the, the structural timbers that are sort of beat up and burned and broken in some instances and jaggedy ends and all that stuff. You know, I don't want those falling on people as they ride through here. Nobody does. So I've got them flashing some of the joints out there with flashing that doesn't show. I mean, as you go out, that's over your shoulder. Nobody sees that. So, yeah. But, but I it's think we can hear you. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. I go think ahead. we've probably got uh, time for one more, David, if you'd like to, to keep going. Uh, sure. I'm, I'm here as long as you guys. I, I can talk as long as you can listen. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, yes, we've got a question from uh, Haval here asking, what was the design load for the wind load? Uh, it was 140 or 150 mile, probably 150 uh, in, the, in the terms of the current code. It might have been only 140 at the time, but it was, I know it was at least 140. Some pretty fast, uh, pretty fast wind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and this is well into the interior of Florida. I mean, this is this is Orlando, so you're, you know, you're an hour and a half from the coast. So I mean, not you're you're still pretty close. I mean, you can't get away from the wind in Florida no matter where you go. You know, right. one thing too, Ben. I don't know if you remember them talking about this, but uh, uh, these these rides have a have a a short lifespan, relatively. You know, this isn't something that that they expect to be there in a hundred years. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting thing to consider. And I don't know how, if it affected anything you, David or Ben did, but I just remember them talking that most likely this ride will be recycled once the whole Harry Potter phase is over. 
Um, so I thought that was just a fascinating thing to consider that that they kind of rotate these rides every few decades or whatever. I can't remember what the time frame was, but it was something that they mentioned multiple times. Well, maybe they'll finish the roof and put some posts under these trusses and then close it and make it for a storage building. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it never, that's interesting, Dan, because the question never came up. I mean, it was like, in, uh, you know, they wanted this to be guaranteed and covered for a long, long time. And and I know Ben went down there, as he mentioned, several times to check the maintenance and whatnot. We, we gave them a regular annual maintenance program, but, you know, this was done back in 2000 and what year was this? Uh, 2017. And with the exception of a visit over the next year or two, I, the last couple of years, I've heard nothing about this, not one thing. So just saying. Well, they're still discussing warranty programs versus uh, maintenance programs offered by the supplier, which makes sense to me in, a, in something like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, hope when, you... I hope when they dismantle this, they take it down and repurpose it. I hope that the new owners understand that some of those posts aren't really designed to be load bearing. The, the yeah, mis- exactly, exactly. <laughs> talk about building a talk about building a booby trap of a structure. Trying to repurpose this without realizing what what you really had. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Laurent, uh, I've got a couple of quick sides I can show or whatever. You got more questions? That's- you know what? I think it, we've got three minutes left, but. I- I don't think anybody will mind if you go a minute or two over here. So I'm I'm sure if you want to hop on over to the the, the Hill Holler stage and, and maybe quickly go walk us through this, and then we can uh, we can conclude there. Okay, I I just thought that uh, I, I'm not gonna. Uh, Steve Arthur came to came to me with this. This is a little uh, uh, pavilion up in. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's up near Hill, Hillsville, Virginia. Do you remember the name of that pavilion, Dan, by any chance, that area? Uh, it's, a, it's in Floyd. Uh, it's in Floyd, Floyd, Virginia, for their big Floyd Fest they do, for the music festivals they do a lot up there. Floyd Fest, that's what I was trying to remember. Anyway, I just thought this was an elegant little structure right here. It's a kind of a combination between, you know, they've got timber frame joints in here from the from the uh, plates to the posts, and, and you can see the mortise and tenon uh, and pegs. But I thought Steve did a beautiful job on this, and I thought I'd just share that. Uh, this is another one that uh, I worked on with Lancaster County Timber Frame. This was in a high wind region in Maryland. And you'll notice in this structure, I, I, I used a K-truss here on in the end base. These are steel, swage steel, stainless rods and fittings that took the wind load in this uh, glass walled end wall. And, uh, you know, all too common, an owner comes to us, me, Ben, anybody, all you engineers, it says, you know, I want you to design this in a heavy wind region, but by the way, you can't have any walls in the end of the build. <laughs> it's like, oh, really? <laughs> so anyway, you get to have a little fun. Uh, here's another one that I really like. Uh, th- there are a lot of these around the country, but this was a, a residence uh, up in Virginia, I think, uh, for McNamara's and uh, kind of a I don't know. Let's see. Modified double Pratt or something. I don't know. Which, what, ben, what would you call that? I don't know. Anyway. Call it a compound truss. That's two trusses that are sort of connected together. There so are those uh, rods, are those, do you have the left and right clevises? Is that how you tighten those clevises up? Or do you, do you remember the hardware on this? Uh, yes, I think so. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. They were left and right clevises. Correct. Yeah. And, and Ben, the, the center of those rods are, uh, Flatten to put a wrench on. Yeah. Sweet. Anyway, this was a fun little job. Uh, we enjoyed it immensely and <laughs> not a big deal, but you know, it's so nice once in a while to get something a little different and, and then be challenged by, you know, how to put it together. And and the double rod thing was an architectural idea. You of course didn't need that, but I mean it worked out nicely. Uh big pipe compression strut could have been timber, but I think it's I think it's neat and probably half again in diameter as big as it needed to be, but it, it, everything looks aesthetically balanced uh, in this. If anything, this is a little, feels a little small and narrow to me, but you know, hey, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? And, and of course, in this structure, you can see up here, they've got uh, steel saddle connectors for these roof purlins. Uh, normally we would just house them into the rafters, but uh, that's not how they chose to do it. 
So that kind of brings us full circle, LeBron. Uh, thank you all for listening. I, I really appreciate everyone that showed up. Uh, I will put in a shameless plug for my book. I'm, I'm working on the uh, audible version of it. I've, I've built my own studio. I couldn't hire anybody to, to narrate it because it was going to be two or $3,000. And I thought, well, I can figure out how to do this myself for about four, $400 worth of equipment. I've got myself a little recording studio in the back of the office, and uh, this weekend I start, uh, I'll start i start recording the chapters in uh, Consulting Engineering Success. But if you haven't read this book and you're a structural engineer or anybody listening to this, I think you'd really get something out of it. It's You can't buy a hamburger for what this book costs, and uh, I would encourage you to read it. And if you like it and, and feel inclined to leave a favorable review, uh, that would be awesome. I was overwhelmed with the one that uh, Frank Wooste uh the uh, 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 professor emeritus from uh, Virginia Tech uh, uh, left uh, last week. Uh, Frank just kind of blew me away, but it was very kind of him to do that. Thank you, Laurent. Well, thank you, David. Thank you as well to everyone who contributed, who asked some questions and shared their experiences with these projects as well. Um, and thank you, everybody, for attending. I'll share my screen very quickly just to... Uh, Laurent, Laurent, can I... Let me interrupt just one second. I yeah. would also like to thank Chris and Ben and Dan for coming on with me and, and sharing uh, the discussion. It was so helpful. It, it adds so much. Uh, it adds a fourth dimension to the conversation, and I appreciate it so much. Thank you, guys. Thank a you. big thank you. Seriously, that, that was really, really great. And I'm just going to share my screen for one second here. And um, just to show you, we've got a couple uh, other webinars coming up if you'd like to sign up. So next week, um, I'll be running one on doing wind load calculations in residential structures. And some of you might have seen we recently released our calculator for uh, main wind force resisting system loads. So um, we'll go through how we calculate those. And then a month from now, we'll be looking at steel base plate designs in American standards. Again, if you're looking at um, creating base plates for your columns. And um, David will be joining us again. Um, time to be determined, but he's going to be talking about how to start your own engineering practice, um, kind of in the same lines as his book, but you'll get to be alive with him and learn and ask questions um, as he speaks through this. So Keep an eye out and we'll be sending out more details about this, but you can always go to clearcalcs.com slash webinars and you'll be able to sign up right there. And with that, thank you so much, everyone who attended. We're going to be sending out a recording by email. This is also going to be on YouTube and on our website if you'd like to watch parts of it again. Um, we'll be sending you out a survey. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we can do better, what you liked. Um, if you've got any advice for David as well, um, I'm sure he'll appreciate it. I think um, he's always looking for ways to improve like we all are. And so please, I uh, would love if you can answer it. If you've got any questions, if you want to try out clear calcs and you want us to perhaps um, walk you through it or something like that, you can always email us at help at clearcalcs.com. We'll be more than happy to help. And Stay tuned. We've got more coming up. Thank you, Laurent. So Thank long. you all. Thank you, guys. You guys have a good one. You too. Bye-bye.